Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Election Day is coming up November 8th, and in addition to voting for candidates for office and to serve in our courts, if you flip your ballot over to the other side, you will find amendment proposals that you have the opportunity to vote on. Tonight's guests from the city's Racial Justice Commission urge you to take a look at those and vote on them. There you will see four, four ballots. The first is a state proposal to approve borrowing $4.2 billion to fund environmental protection policies and projects. But the next three are city proposals put forth by the city's Racial Justice Commission that begin to directly address systemic racial inequities that have plagued our city for generations. These are cutting-edge proposals designed to make New York City, without mincing words, the fairest city in the nation when it comes to equal opportunity. And so in BronxNet's ongoing voter literacy efforts, uh, tonight we're going to review those proposals with the people who created them. Please join me in welcoming the executive director of the City's Racial Justice Commission. It is Mr. Harold Miller. Nice to have you with us, uh, sir. Thank you for having me. And uh, one of the commissioners of the Racial Justice Commission. It's Kay Bain. Nice to have you with Good us, sir. Good to see you, Gary. Good to see you. Uh, Mr. Miller, let's uh, just start with you. Um, let's go back to the beginning. Why a Racial Justice Commission? And then, of course, we'll get into uh, what you guys came up with. Uh, uh, thanks for the question. Back in 2020, um, we were in face of a pandemic. Uh, faced with um, racial strife with uh, the killing of George Floyd, um, other instances of, of racial unrest, and we were battling COVID at the same time. And then COVID exposed um, the inequities that exist in our city um, starkly. And so it compelled um, then Mayor Bill de Blasio to take some action. And one of the actions taken uh, was to uh, call for a Charter Revision Commission to address structural racism in our city and um, have this commission charged with identifying and potentially proposing um, reforms that will begin to dismantle uh, uh, structural inequities that exist in our city. Has any other, I, I mean, I said that we would be the fairest city in the nation if this happened. Has any other city attempted anything like this that, that you're aware of? As far as I've never heard it before, um, and, and frankly, as a, a New Yorker, I'm kind of proud that, that at least we're having the dialogue. Yeah, this is the first of its kind where you actually have a commission that will put legislation on a ballot for the public to vote on. Um, you have other cities that will have working groups, committees, uh, even, you know, quasi-commissions. But to actually have a commission that's, with, that's had the legal authority to put legislation on a ballot for voters to consider, it's the first that we know of in this country. Kay Bain, let's just talk about um, what, what the task was. I mean, so, so here we are. We want to be the fairest city in the nation. We want to solve some of these systemic uh, inequities. How, how did you go about it, and how did you come up with the proposals? We're going to break down the proposals, yeah. but let's talk about the process that brought us from there to here. Absolutely. Tonight. What a big, hairy, audacious goal to even address structural inequity in the city of New York. Um, it's been a privilege and an honor to be a part of this commission because these are matters that affect every New Yorker in New York City residents um, across the city joined in in the dialogue and conversation to talk about what are some of the largest and even most difficult issues that they face as New Yorkers. Um, Mr. Miller talked about um, some of the um, inequities that came up through uh, the pandemic. I recall sitting in this seat for many years, we've dealt with health care disparities. Oh, yes. <laughs> from the first days right. of doing our right. program 28 years ago. Um, we talk uh, over and over again about housing inequities. Mm -hmm. We talk about um, inequities in the way people are policed and, and uh, in the criminal justice system and in the, in the correction system. Uh, how do you come up with uh, and what kind of dialogue has to exist to say, wait a minute, we want to address all of these things with ballot proposals that, that our friends and neighbors in the Bronx can, can deal with. Yeah, hundreds of hours, it felt like more at times, <laughs> invested in... That's fair. Yeah, in community conversations and very frank and honest dialogue, again, with community residents and stakeholders in every borough, 
So when you're looking at, as you point out, at all of the different silos where people feel oppressed and not seen, it, there's going to be a number, a wide array of challenges presented. We as about 10, 11 commissioners had the responsibility to try to boil that down, and that's no easy task, to boil that down, refine, go through all of those hundreds of hours of testimony and dialogue and interaction to come up with what we thought would be the three most prudent, pertinent items that could start this process. And I want to be clear, we didn't get here in New York City with all of our entanglements and inequity overnight. So what we have as these ballot measures are not a silver bullet that will in one shot fix New York City. But I'm very proud of the work, the diligence, the thoughtfulness that went into this unprecedented work. Uh, Mr. Miller, legislation that comes out uh, people who uh, create legislation, this is not legislation, these are uh, proposals for amendments to uh, the city charter, um, but they're always concerned about saying, well, you know, if we propose something maybe that you like or that you like, but that ain't going to fly when it comes to the voters. Uh, was there, a, in a way, a compromise or a way to figure out how to present these? And we're going to show you what the proposals are, um, how to present these so that they would be palatable, that New Yorkers would be able to relate to them. Well, that was under consideration throughout the process. It's like, what, what, are the, what are the things that New Yorkers are talking about? And when you talk about uh, racial inequities, it could go in so many different directions, whether it be healthcare disparities, education disparities. Um, yeah, that was one I didn't mention <laughs> when I gave you my long list. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, criminal justice. There are so many different angles that we, can, we could have taken. And we decided as a commission to, what are, what are some Funda you know, the fundamental structures that uphold structural racism in our city. Mm -hmm. And how do we actually uh, start to dismantle that, begin to dismantle that, you know? And, and, and you think New Yorkers are, are ready for it? I, I have to yeah. tell you, I do, personally. But you thought yeah. even having, the, like having this dialogue is healthy to start. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, as Commissioner Bain talked about, we have met with thousands of New Yorkers over the past year and a half. Um, held many, many community uh, meetings in person, virtual, uh, received thousands of input from New Yorkers. And I think one thing is for certain that we know that racism is um, pervasive in our society, and this is an opportunity to do something about it. So whether or not the ballot questions are, are ways to address it, that's up for the voters to decide, but I think it's clear that um, racism is something that we do need to address as a city. Let, let's just, we'll take a look at um, the first one, um, which I have to tell you, when, when I saw it, and, and you gentlemen know that I had moderated a, um, a forum at uh, the Bronx Museum maybe about a month ago, so I learned a lot about it. When I heard this idea, so um, the proposal would amend the New York City Charter to add a preamble, which would be an introductory statement of values and vision aspiring toward a just and equitable city for all New Yorkers. Now, a preamble, we know about the preamble in the Constitution, let's say, of the United States of America. So this would basically put in writing that New York City has to be fair, right? Yes. Is, that, is that what we're doing? Yeah, it's... it's I, to me, that <laughs> it blew my mind when I heard that. I was like, wait a minute, you've got to be kidding me that it makes so much sense. It, it's just like the preamble to the Constitution of the United States of America. Absolutely. You think about it that... New York City existed for hundreds of years without actually what what are who are we well, you know what kind of city are we mm -hmm. you know what what's we, our we never set the rules like right. you're not allowed to be unfair <laughs> right so it's crazy it's insane but let's do it yeah. know, that's the way I feel about it I can't so help. that so that that idea of a statement of, of that guides who we are as a people as a, as New Yorkers um, is important because how do we actually identify how we can make our city better without stating kind of what the aspiration of a city should look like. Uh, Commissioner, so now, let's say it passes, okay? Mm -hmm. I, know, I know there are It will, people, it will. You believe it will, all right. <laughs> um, but let's say it passes. Let, there's a development project. The big one, want to redo Hudson Yards. Or, I mean, there's, certainly in the Bronx, we want to, um, uh, you know, build up the Hunts Point market. Mm -hmm. When the city um, deals with the land use issues and all those things, does this mean that those considerations are required to be in that dialogue? And if somebody says, if you put that housing project there, it's going to be unfair to people of color, then they can't do it? 
Well, I mean, uh, how, how does this play so, if that's like the theory we're dealing with? I, I like the question. The first ballot measure, which is the preamble, as was, was stated, is about framing the conversation. And I just want to step back and say how important that is. It's almost like a disclaimer. The preamble in itself pays tribute and respect to the ancestors and how we got here. And I was, I was taken aback too when I was informed that, you know, and I've looked at the city charter, which is essentially New York City's constitution, of course, so yes. to speak, and it didn't have this very important foundational framing. So when you start any process, right, if your intention is pure, if you are very explicit and transparent, in the energy that you want to put into what is going to be very difficult deliberations and decisions, I think you're in a much better place to move forward. So the pre preamble takes into account, for example, that people were brought here against their will, that indigenous people lived here, died here on this land. It's almost like a moment of silence before we go into the business of New York City. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not sure how we existed for 170, 200, I mean, whatever it was years, like without a guiding so, preamble. So, again, I want to put it into the, let's, let's get in the boardrooms as we start to talk about, um, you know, let's put a hospital in a certain neighborhood, but mm -hmm. maybe not in another. Um, th then basically somebody in that meeting has to say, well, wait a minute, it doesn't adhere to um, uh, the preamble. I mean, does it add a complication? I, I don't see that at all. You don't all. see that? No. I think that a lot of the time in doing business with New York City and in New York City, there are considerations for these things. This preamble only makes it explicit. And I think that a lot of people who have dedicated their life to building and their lives and their ancestors' lives to building this great city are paid homage and acknowledged. And we do that in the city of New York constantly. You look at Wall Street in that area, there are places where Africans were sold, and that's marked and noted. There are different signages and things. So this is something that we do as a great city already. We're known as the melting pot. We're known as a city where people from all over the earth can come and find freedom and justice, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes we don't live up to that, but a preamble like the one that we constructed reminds us that in every endeavor in business in this city, that that is the foundation and the premise on which this democracy is supposed to live and up to. A lot of our uh, activities um, should 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 fall. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just curious your your thought about that about the application of the preamble in the daily. Now you worked with HHC in the past, so yeah. how, how would that play? I mean, and and, and to me, a lot of what um, uh, the commissioner said was. Um, just getting it in people's minds, even if they don't sit there and say, well, I'm going to vote this way because of the preamble, mm -hmm. but it'll be in the back of their minds that that's the state of mind we need when we think about building a new hospital or a, yeah. a facility. Yeah, it's really for all of us as New Yorkers, whether it be, you know, your citizen who's a nurse or a teacher or your policymaker, that we have this document that guides the government that we live in. And so a decision about... We hold about, these truths to be self-evident, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suppose. That's right. That's uh, right. what we're talking about. <laughs> so you, you think about it, when it comes to uh, a development, for example, are we, is this development upholding to our values as New Yorkers? You know, and sometimes we may make a conscious decision and say, well, no, but we, this development will go on. That's a, that's a decision New Yorkers will make, you know, or the, those who make policy. But, but it's to put the thought in the conversation to put like, okay, here's who we are. Here's what um, our city values. It values making sure that all New Yorkers are safe, making sure that all New Yorkers have access to opportunities and, and power, making sure that all New Yorkers be able to see themselves and be able to know that this is a city for, for everyone. And so every decision that's uh, made moving forward, if these ballot measures pass, we have to put that into consideration. Does every New Yorker see themselves? Does it, this have opportunity for all New Yorkers? It, it has to be in people's minds. I mean, it's in a lot of people's minds already. This, in a way, certifies it. Uh, Commissioner, let's talk about uh, number two, um, which is uh, to establish a racial equity office plan and commission. It would amend the city charter to require citywide and agency-specific racial equity plans every two years. So now we're getting into kind of the nuts and bolts of what I was talking about before, right. how we're going to actually do this. Plans would include intended strategies and goals to improve racial equity 
and uh, to reduce or eliminate racial disparities. Uh, let's talk about people, do they want another office? Do they want, is this more bureaucracy? Uh, I remember um, David Dinkins, when he was mayor, had numerous different offices about each type of, of uh, you know, life, each category of life in the city. Right. And a lot of that was taken down when uh, Rudy Giuliani became the mayor. Um, are we back now to say, well, wait a minute, we're going to add more bureaucracy here? Right. You know, what, what are your thoughts? I'm, I'm very anti-bureaucracy. So I understand the concern, and we did talk about this. But this particular innovation is about accountability. So we have X amount of agencies across the city, but where is the accountability? How do we plan, forecast? How do we work inside of this great city to make sure that things are actually, if nothing else, incrementally improving and moving in the right direction? Right now, developers make statements. They say 30%, 40%. We say good. You're talking about affordable. Yep. Okay. Uh, so that will happen. That's a conversation. And then things progress. And then who holds what accountable? Similarly, with agencies around the city of New York, there's rhetoric, there's talk. But if we have this in place, which I hope happens, then there's a mechanism, a system, a direct uh, commission or initiative towards accountability. So, so that, um, uh, much like, let's say, the Department of Investigations or something like that. So it, 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 uh, 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 we were talking before about different projects. So a project goes through or it's being planned at some point aside from the preamble being out there, then uh, it would have to go through an office and the office of whether, whether the process is stamp of approval or whatever would say, yes, this complies with our guidelines. And I think that built into this is a monitoring, is a support system, because I know a lot of agencies, businesses want to do the right thing in New York City. So maybe when this becomes uh, in practice, we'll see the improvement. And I think that's the spirit and energy behind this ballot measure. Mr. Miller, does yeah. this come with an implied funding thing that you're going to have to fund an office uh, to do this? Yes, but it's, a, it's very minimal. I, I appreciate <laughs> that you just came right out and said it. No, no, it won't cost us any money. So no, I I'm, I'm, I'm a straight shooter. When it, you know, uh, if we are to prioritize racial equity in the city, we have to invest in it. Um, and we have a $101 billion budget in, in the city. Um, and by forecast, uh, uh, Office of Racial Equity will cost no more than $10 million in this first year. Mm -hmm. And it will have such a critical need because it will work with city agencies to help develop those racial equity plans. Each agency will be required to um, have uh, performance indicators, data indicators to show um, what are they doing to move the needle around um, reducing disparities and, and increasing greater inclusion uh, around racial equity. And so that office plays a critical role, sort of like how we think about Office of Budget and Management. They exist to make sure that agencies have funding mm -hmm. and, ha and, and make sure their budgets are aligned. This, will to, uh, this office is to ensure that racial equity is in the centerpiece of, of city government. You know, you know what's interesting, and I mentioned uh, before about um, uh, David Dinkins, and he had many different offices through City Hall with all different um, you know, uh, aspects of, of life. But then the next mayor came in and said, no, if this becomes part of the city charter, charter then that can't happen. I mean, regardless of what uh, Mayor Adams thinks about it, whoever's the next mayor right. into the future. Right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. It, uh, uh, part of the reason this is a charter revision commission and so it can uh, live beyond an administration um, because we know that different mayors will have different priorities. But if, if racial equity is, is to be a priority for the city, it needs to be embedded into and codified into our, our city laws and no better place than to in the charter. Uh, so it will take another charter commission to remove it. <laughs> uh, well, let's see if anybody's bold enough to say New York doesn't want to be the fairest city in the nation. I'd like to see that. I wouldn't like to see That's that happen, right. of course. Um, let's talk about number three. Um, I thought when I, you know, as I learned about this, I, this, this was in a way strange. I would never have thought that this would have been part of a racial justice commission. Uh, a, a ballot question three uh, says, measure the true cost of living. Uh, the proposal would amend the city charter to require the city to create a true cost of living measure to track the actual cost in New York City of meeting essential needs, including housing, food, child care, transportation, and other necessary costs, uh, and without considering public, private, or informal assistance in order to inform pro programmatic 
and policy decisions. Hold on, Gary, can I slow that down? You said including, say that again. Housing, Just, food, um, childcare, transportation, and other necessary costs. And all of these were what New Yorkers came to us and talked to us about. And so if we're talking about equity and justice for people in New York City, these are the areas, as you said earlier, how do you boil it down was your question, I think. Right. How do you boil it down? Well, this tackles a lot of these silos of oppression or when people feel disinvested in one. Federally, we look at this. Federally, there's a, there's a rate and a standard that we say this is the poverty line. New York City is a very special and unique global city. So we have to look at it as that. And I think this ballot measure does a great job at pushing us in a more critically analytical position. But what's interesting to me is it says, it doesn't say you have to lower the cost, which we'd all would love, but it says you have to measure the true cost. Yeah. Um, I suppose, um, although it, it fluctuates in my own personal budget, I <laughs> know somewhat of the true cost of me living and, and breathing and, and you know, doing what I want to do in New York City. Um, why measure the true cost and not say, hey, look, we want to make the cost equitable or something like that. You want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. it's, it's about, um, you know, we want to know exactly where we are as a city of how expensive it is to live here. We all know it's expensive. We all know it costs a lot of money. It serves a couple of purposes. One, um, when we have a true cost of living measure, you can actually see indicators of whether or not New Yorkers are close, are, are close to that number. And, you know, quite honestly, we will see a racial disparity in the first measurement. Then it's up to the city to decide how do we actually work towards closing that gap. And that's where question two kind of connects because that's there where will the be work... An office to, uh, I, I just want to get back to this actual cost. Now, for some people who live on the Upper West Side or even in some parts of the Bronx, it costs a little bit more. Uh, because they, in many cases, have a little more wherewithal uh, than people who live in other communities. Mm -hmm. uh, are, are we coming up with one number, mm -hmm. or are we saying if you live in Marsania, it's different than living in Highbridge, or different than living in Riverdale, or like, how do you, I, I'm, I'm working at getting my arms <laughs> around this, I'm not quite yeah. there yet. Yeah, so a lot of it will be up to the discretion of the administration that will implement uh, the cost of living measure. However, the, the intent is to you have a citywide measure, and we know that different parts of the city have different, um, different levels, and then you go break it down by you know, area, whether it be by borough or zip code, that, that's really up to you oh, know, so, those who So would, that part of it uh, is still to be determined? Well, de determine on exactly how, how um, precise you want to be as far as uh, a, a measurement you know, by, you know, uh, by I, I, neighborhood or zip code I, I, or, or zip community code. board. I tell you, that it would be fascinating. It, this would be a fascinating, you know, as somebody who's lived here in, in the Bronx for essentially my whole life, it would be fascinating to know what is the cost, uh, you know, in, in Throg's Neck versus um, even a place nearby, Westchester Square, mm -hmm. or what is it the cost in, in Mott Haven versus Soundview? Is there a different cost? Uh, you know, that, I think that would be a, a fascinating dialogue. Um, uh, Commissioner, let's just talk about um, voting and talk about the nature of voting. One of the things that you folks have made clear, and I said it right at the top, flip the ballot. Flip the ballot. So mm -hmm. the, 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 and let's just educate voters. So the first page is all the um, people running for office or right. for the courts and yep. all those positions. Do, are we concerned? I guess you are concerned that people will not go to the other side and, and mark it off? Yeah, something as simple as that, uh, which could be convenient or inconvenient, depending on how much we get the word out to you. But there's been, again... We're trying, man. Yeah, we're, we're doing trying. it, and we thank you sincerely for helping <laughs> and be a part of this awareness campaign. This is the work for and by New York City residents. So these ballot measures are what New York City has said over the past year and a half is a priority to them. And I want to make sure that New York City gets an opportunity to know, see, understand, and appreciate what they said was the priority. So as you said so well, flip the ballot. Do your due diligence. Um, yeah. Make the most of your opportunity absolutely. to vote. And it's not only for the candidates of your choice, but it's also to maybe have this kind of uh, uh, impact. Uh, yes, I'll sir. ask you first, and then we'll uh, go to Mr. Miller about it. Was there anything that came up in all those dialogues you had that surprised you? 
Was there anything that you said, wow, I had, I mean, because some of this yeah. is relatively logical. If somebody said, you know, we have health care disparities or it costs me too much in my supermarket, I, right. I, I understand, or to pay my rent, we get that. Was there anything that people said that surprised you or was it, was it really confirming what you knew? I really liked the question. Um, I wouldn't describe it as surprise, but it was very emotional. Um, this experience, this journey of listening to New Yorkers and hearing their pleas, hearing their struggles. As a New Yorker myself, I'm very familiar with that. I come from a very humble beginning. And so when we visited the various boroughs, all five boroughs, and had these conversations, and after we got off the record and testimonies went out, people would grab you and, and pull you to the side and just talk about food apartheid and talk about what it feels like to not be able to have nutritious, healthy food in their, in their neighborhoods and communities or the dysfunction in education facilities where they felt like young this people. This school gets and my school does Exactly. Right. So we know these things, but this process has reinvigorated a lot of us to make sure that we, you know, we don't become desensitized to the pleas and cries of New York City. We have the largest food market in, uh, in, in the nation, uh, in the South Bronx. Yeah. And... Um, People uh, in those neighborhoods that, li that live right near there have some of the worst food insecurity. I guess that's, that's what we heard. That's what we heard and, uh, and much more. Um, we live in a city that inequity is so vast. Um, we have the very rich that lives here and those who are, you know, uh, beyond struggling to make ends meet. And what are we doing as a city to address the needs of all and New Yorkers? And you think these proposals are getting us closer? You know, uh, voters vote on that. I believe we will be much closer uh, because that work will happen to ensure that uh, New Yorkers um, are, are able to have access, opportunity, and power. Right. Uh, Executive Director of the Racial Justice Commission, Harold Miller, thank you. Thank Kay you. Bain, one of the commissioners, thank you. Thank You've you, given Gary. us a lot to think about. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is what we're going to do. We're going to vote. You're going to do all the X's and do what you got to do. Flip that and ballot. Flip the ballot. And then you say, oh, that was the uh, uh, amendments I heard them talking about on Bronx Talk and on Bronx Talk. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you for the great work. And thank you for the dialogue. Uh, before we leave tonight, we want to, of course, thank our great producers, Rebecca Hammock and Stephen Powell. Our director is Benaya War. We have a cast of thousands of great young people around us. And um, we want to say to the people of the Bronx, a reminder, flip your ballot. Make sure you vote on the amendment proposals on November 8th. And guess what happens next week? We'll see you then. Good night.